long semester. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Professor Jerry Lynch from the University of Michigan. Uh, he got his PhD at Stanford in 2002 before heading to the University of Michigan. Um, some his areas in cyber infrastructure, um, structural health monitoring, nano engineered thin film sensors, and um, structural management with cyber um, tools. And uh, some kind of notable achievements. Uh, he got the PKS award and the ONR Young Investigator Award, um, along with the Da Vinci Medal um, and the Hoover Prize. With Hoover. Yeah. Yep. Um, from ASC. Um, and so it's my real pleasure to have him here, and I'm really excited to hear his talk. So um, please join me in welcoming our speaker. So before I begin, though, I would like to say thank you to Professor Linderman, as well as all the faculty, staff, and students here at the University of Minnesota. It's actually my second time uh, visiting here, providing a seminar, and uh, this trip has been as delightful as the first one, so thank you. The title of the talk is Long-Term Management and Control, Bridges Using Cyber-Physical Systems and Cloud-Based Analytics. Before I begin, I'd like to just give an overview of the talk. Uh, most of my work at the University of Michigan is focused on the application of sensing and control technologies to provide safe and resilient critical infrastructure systems. And in that spirit, today's presentation will be broken down into four parts. First, I'd like to begin with a few words of motivation, highlighting some of the grand challenges that we foresee for the uh, foreseeable future in civil and environmental, and how there's opportunities for cyber physical systems and cloud analytics to impact those grand challenges. I'd like then, uh, I would like to then segue into the description of cyber physical systems as a general area and show its application to one testbed structure, the Telegraph Road Bridge in the state of Michigan. In the third part, I'd like to expand on that architecture to not only do health management of those infrastructure systems, but also try to control the loadings that introduce wear and tear into those structures using the same CPS framework. And at the end, I'd like to say a few words of conclusion and for the students in the audience, highlight some of the key opportunities going forward in this space. So let's begin with motivation. There's a number of grand challenges that have emerged in recent years that for the foreseeable future will garner significant attention by our profession. For example, we're seeing massive urbanization across the globe. Uh, 2010 was a significant year. It was a tipping point year where more than 50% of the world's population for the first time resided in urban areas. And those numbers are going to grow. With that rapid urbanization, though, comes high population density, as well as extreme loads and extreme demands imposed on our infrastructure systems, as well as the challenges associated with planning those infrastructure systems in a rational and optimal manner. On the other end of the spectrum, in countries like the United States, where we have relatively mature infrastructure, we're seeing infrastructure essentially aging. And with age comes deterioration and risks that introduce notions of failure in our infrastructure. For example, the American Society of Civil Engineers often rates our infrastructure between a C and a D grade, attesting to that fact. And if neglected, catastrophic events can occur. For example, shown here is the gas pipeline explosion in San Bruno in the early 2000s due to undetected deterioration or corrosion of buried gas pipelines. Also, climate change is challenging our notions of how we design and how we manage our infrastructure. For example, climate change is introducing water scarcity issues, particularly in the western part of the United States. Also, climate change is introducing an increase in both occurrence and severity of some natural hazard events, such as tropical storms, also challenging the performance of our infrastructure systems. Now, fortunately, there's a number of technologies that are emerging that present opportunities for addressing aspects of these grand challenges that have emerged. For example, we've seen an explosion of computational power over the past few decades, as embodied in Moore's Law, which up until very recently essentially represented the doubling of computing speed every 18 months. Similarly, in the communication arena, we have Eldholm's Law, which essentially shows similar logarithmic trends of growth of available wireless bandwidth, meaning it's easier and faster to send data through wireless interfaces. We've seen an explosion of the miniaturization of sensors. For example, many of our cell phones have uh, MEMS-based accelerometers, MEMS-based pressure sensors, and the like. And then finally, what I think is one of the greatest technological achievements of the 20th century is the internet. Unprecedented levels of connectivity between people as well as between machines. So the confluence of these four technology trends 
has created this uh, notion or definition of what's termed as the cyber physical system or CPS architecture. And cyber physical systems is a synergistic, and the term synergistic is very important here, combination of sensing, computing, and actuation. In a CPS architecture, we typically begin with the physical system. In our application domain, that would be an infrastructure system, a bridge, a building, a waterway, what have you. And the dynamics of that system are governed by the physics of the system and its exposure to environmental and operational loading. Now, we can embed sensors in those, in those systems. We can also embed actuators to both monitor and control. And these technologies have been around for many, many decades. And there's many successful examples of sensors and actuators in the form of monitoring control systems deployed in real operational structures, such as long span bridges in the western part of the United States, as well as many tall rise buildings in Japan exposed to extreme earthquake loads, such as the Mori Tower, which is one of the most densely instrumented controlled structures in the world. But by themselves, these notions of monitoring control are not cyber physical systems. Cyber physical system differentiates itself from these traditional approaches to monitoring control through the introduction of computing, which has been made readily available through the introduction of the internet and internet connectivity between our sensors and our actuators. That's challenging even the approaches that we would use for control and monitoring, forcing our community to move away from sole reliance on essentially the physics of the problem as manifested, for example, in differential equation form into things that are more based on data, data-driven approaches that might invoke machine learning and other type of techniques. We can go even one step further beyond just computing power available on the internet and look at the migration of that computing power to the direct point of data acquisition at the sensors themselves. Often uh, the community and the industry would also refer to that as sort of the internet of things paradigm where we have embedded intelligence directly with our <coughs> sensors giving us opportunity for computing both at large scale on the internet as well as locally at our point of data collection. Now fortunately cyber physical systems, the civil and environmental engineering community has been in the vanguard of the development of this technology. So even though uh, many of our uh, collaborators and colleagues in other disciplines would claim ownership of this area, it's actually this technology has been applied to our particular systems. So some examples. Early earthquake warnings is a prime example of a cyber physical system where you have strong ground motion arrays distributed through a country. They record data. That data is communicated via the internet to computers that essentially are extracting pertinent metrics from those ground motions and then communicating that out to points of actuation. In this case, as you can see here, uh, those early warning systems are used in Japan to slow down Shinkansen trains so we don't derail. So that would be a prime example. Another example is the emergence of intelligent transportation systems. We hear quite a bit these days about connected vehicles, connected vehicles to each other, to the infrastructure, autonomy in our vehicles. That's all driven by cyber physical systems that have this heavy reliance on computing, both locally at the vehicle itself, as well as globally at the network level. Another example is how we operate things such as wind farms, where we have a lot of aerodynamic coupling between our energy generators in a wind farm there's a lot of analysis and communication between them to optimize the maximum power output from that offshore wind farm. And a final example would be essentially smart regional grids that essentially allow the network to essentially reconfigure itself based on demand and supply parameters, unlike today where everything is stationary and pre-planned. So now I'd like to transgress into sort of an area of application of the cyber physical system architecture with specific application to the health management of bridges. So before I could do that, we need to essentially summarize what are the current options available for health management of our critical infrastructure. The primary approach that's used for bridges as well as many other uh, infrastructure systems is primarily visual inspections. This is often required by law for most of our public owned infrastructure such as roads and bridges. And it relies on the expertise and the knowledge of an inspector a very well-trained inspector that is looking for signs of deterioration and damage. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, the information you're receiving is largely a qualitative basis of information. So it's giving you a lot of qualitative information. There's some quantitative aspects to it to a condition rating, but that condition rating is still based on a qualitative description of what that inspector sees. Alternatively, we can get quantitative data, and we have for many decades using non-destructive evaluation technologies, such as acoustics, ultrasonics, infrared th thermography, what have you. 
This can provide a quantitative basis, but it does require often manual application of the technology. This technology has proven to be both very difficult to scale up as well as to miniaturize and reduce in costs. So while it's a very effective technology, it usually requires some a priori knowledge of the deterioration mechanisms you may have in your system. An increasingly popular alternative to the NDE approach is the installation of permanent structural monitoring systems, which are essentially permanent arrays of sensors installed on in our infrastructure, providing a wealth of quantitative data on the performance of that infrastructure system. While this technology shows tremendous promise, there are drawbacks to the technology, first and foremost being its ability to essentially provide you a scenario of data inundation. So that introduces this notion of a monitoring paradox. On one hand, most designers of structural monitoring systems work by this old age, age old adage, information is power, meaning I'm going to put a lot of sensors out there get as much data as I can get, and then try to, based on the data I have, infer the condition of that particular structure. This is actually becoming more and more of a possibility, largely because the price point of these sensing technologies continues to reduce as the functionality of these technologies increase, giving you the ability to generate more and more data in a more accessible way. But it's a double-edged uh, scenario, double-edged sword scenario for the owner, because what we have is we have a wealth of data but we don't really have information that's going to drive the decision maker to make better decisions. What's needed are scalable data management methods as well as new approaches to an analytic uh, or analytic approaches to how we'll process that data to actually take high bandwidth raw data to convert it into low bandwidth actionable information. So the key point here is that our ability using novel sensors has far outpaced our ability to actually analyze that data. And we're not really truly empowering the decision maker that is craving to make better decisions based on a quantitative basis. <coughs> we also need to think more universally about what the needs of that owner are with respect to their decision making processes. So really it's a question about data versus decision. Do owners want data or do they just want to make better decisions? And most owners will tell you is that they don't necessarily want data for the sake of having data, but they want to make better decisions using the data that they can generate. So really the end all is that decision making and the ability to make better decisions. And they don't often care about actual possession or ownership of the data. They just want something that gives them a little bit more insight to what's going on with their structure. And towards that end, we have to understand what the multi-step process that all these decision makers are going to make. And it's a four-step process, really. The first step is clearly the acquisition of data. It's not to say that it's all about decisions. Data is a very important prerequisite in this process, and it represents the first step. And there, we not only want information on the response of the structure, but the load, the environmental parameters, what have you. Step two is, once we have that data, is to do damage detection. This is often what people refer to as structural health monitoring. They're trying to infer states of health from the data they collect. What is the state of the structure? But that by itself doesn't actually drive decision making alone. The third step is prognostics. You need to, once you have some understanding of deterioration or damage, is to start to make statements about what that damage means to the owner. And in the case of structure, it often will have to map to what is the capacity of the structure? What's residual capacity that you have in that system? And what does it mean both in the short term and the long term? And that's where we come into a stage of prescription, what to do about it. Do you take action now? Can you wait? Is it better to wait? Is it better to act now? So this four-step process really is what the decision makers are craving. So it's not just data, and it's not even just damage detection. It's really, at the end of the day, about prescribing better actions for the decision maker. So the objectives that I'll be presenting today is first is to develop a cyber physical system that essentially provides the framework and the infrastructure necessary to empower decision makers to make better decisions. And we'll apply those architectures on operational bridge structures. Second, I'd like to highlight the development of a decision support system for bridge owners that not only account for the response and behavior of the structure, but does so in the context of the environmental and operational conditions of the structure, or the EOC parameters. Using that, we'll use a straightforward statistical process control framework to essentially provide a means of inferring essentially performance of the system and transgressions to abnormal states through an SPC framework. And then more recently, we've been looking at a lot of reliability-based methods to articulate that 
into essentially a measure of capacity, as can be uh, potentially represented in the form of a reliability index, a beta index. Then I'd like to highlight the ability to extend that cyber-physical system to control the loads that are actually imposed on our structures. And in this case, we'll be looking at modeling essentially the vehicle bridge interaction that exists between heavy trucks and bridges and trying to control those particular loads. The beating heart of the cyber-physical system framework that we develop is a server that we call the SendStore server, which is largely a database server that essentially archives information that's being generated not just from our sensor network, but also information that's inherent to the structure itself, what we'd refer to as the metadata of the structure, parameters such as geometry, materials, uh, condition ratings, among other things. This SenStore data framework essentially is going to then expose in a secure manner that data and information to the decision maker, as well as the analytical tool sets that that decision maker may use to convert that data into statements about the health, the capacity, uh, of that particular system. So what I'll focus on for the next few slides is actually the design and the rationale of that SenStore database system that will serve as the beating heart of our analytics. So the objectives are fivefold for SenStore at the outset. First was to unify not just temporal sensor data that we would generate from a monitoring system, but to unify it with all the information we have about the asset we're trying to manage. So there we're going to combine multiple forms of database representations of data to essentially give us scalability to drive our analytics forward. And there we're combining essentially relational database architectures with what's known as NoSQL based database architectures that are based on essentially matrix formulations, column row orientation of time history data. Second, we're seeking not to replace existing management tools such as AshtoWare, formerly known as Pontus, but to be complementary to it, to be synergistic with that, because most bridge owners are already using these tools. So our schema that we'll adopt in our database design includes industry-established uh, element classes, which is necessary to map information between these two database systems. Finally, we're looking for scalability to handle large volumes of data. We're talking about a large number of sensors generating a large amount of data around which we'll do analytics. And there, the NoSQL database architectures are quite critical. We want to ensure security in this day and age of um, terrorist possibilities. We want to ensure that our infrastructure data is secure. And then finally, we want to support multiple program languages to open up the tool to a broad class of potential users. So our SenStore database essentially wraps within this, in the same server uh, architecture three database strategies in what we refer to as a hybrid database approach to data management. At the core of our database architecture is a relational database, which is very well suited for holding the metadata, the information that's geometric, material-based, even inspector information, is well suited for storage in a relational database. But relational databases essentially do not scale well when we have large volumes of vectorized data, such as time history data. To address that limitation of the relational database, we're adopting NoSQL-based databases, and in this study we're using um, hierarchical data format schemas to essentially be a NoSQL type database that essentially will vectorize our time history data, giving us significant speed up in query of that time history data. Also for other type of information that's neither suited for, the, for a relational database or a NoSQL database, we'll use a flat file system that maps through the relational database for things such as videos, uh, pictures that inspectors may take, what have you. These three databases essentially are wrapped within the same uh, server architecture using a platform known as Zero C, uh, ICE middleware engine, which essentially is going to unify these databases, manage our queries, manage our services, including security of access to that particular data. But it also exposes a variety, a plurality of different programming languages, opening up the platform to a large user base. In terms of performance, the scalability of the system uh, is being tested as we go. Uh, to date, on the Telegraph Road Bridge where we have a permanent monitoring system, and I'll show you this bridge today, we have over 28 gigabytes worth of response data. On another bridge that we're monitoring uh, in California, the new Carquina Suspension Bridge, we've been monitoring that now six years, and we have over 54 gigabytes worth of response data from our sensors. We can time the query performance, and we can compare the performance of SenStore that has a very, very elegant scalability aspect to it based on that NoSQL component to the database schema against a traditional relational database where we're holding larger and larger tracts of time history data. And you start to see 
essentially the linear scaling lowers associated with each. There's a slight linear scaling lower here, but it's relatively flat in comparison to a traditional relational database architecture. What we've done is we've now applied this SenseStore database architecture to essentially support our ongoing efforts in the field at monitoring data, at acquiring monitoring data from operational structures. And the structure I'll focus on in today's presentation is the Telegraph Road Bridge, which is a bridge that's roughly 40 years old. It's in the state of Michigan. It's a traditional steel girder, comp concrete deck, and composite action over most of the span. But one of the unique things about this structure is not only its deterioration mechanisms, and you can see a number here, for example, uh, failure of the abutment structure, necessitating some temporary shoring action, some corrosion, but a unique aspect of this bridge is the use of pin and hanger connections, which was very common in the state of Michigan from the 1960s into the early 1980s. And still roughly 30% of our steel girder bridges in the state are of this design quality, essentially using these hanger plates that fully support the center span. Um, if you have uh, two girders, for example, this would necessitate the bridge being rated as fatigue critical, necessitating very aggressive inspection of the structure. In the Telegraph Road Bridge, though, we have multiple girders, so it doesn't fall in that category, but it is a point of failure that's of primary concern to the bridge owner. The pin and hanger design had many advantages when it was used. Um, it simplified design calculations. It elegantly accommodated for thermal expansion of your concrete deck. It reduced the moments that were imposed in the vicinity of your pier and your bearings. And it also moved the expansion joint away from the pier, thereby preserving uh, the integrity of, of the bearings that would typically sit near or directly below those expansion joints. But concerns have led to its discontinued use nationally. In the state of Michigan, there's a moratorium on the use of the pin and hanger design, but they still must manage the large inventory of these bridges that they have. First and foremost is corrosion. Um, and you can see an example. This is a hanger plate, not from Telegraph Road, but from another bridge in the state of Michigan that shows the extreme corrosion profile of this hanger plate shown here. This has been torch cut, so it's not a fatigue crack. But this is a primary concern. Then fatigue does become a primary concern when you're thinning or losing cross-section of that particular uh, plate. This would have sat behind and would have been very hard to detect by a visual inspection because on the surface it would look fine, but behind it, between the girder face and the plate is where you'd see this pitting action. If this type of corrosion behavior is not caught, you can have things like the Manassas Bridge, which essentially experience a walking effect of the, of the plate off of its pin. So in the Manassas Bridge in the, in the early 1980s in Connecticut, you essentially had corrosion buildup imposing that hanger plate to walk off to the edge of the pin and then a shearing action on the pin face leading to catastrophic brittle failure of the bridge. And this can be a serious issue, particularly for skewed angled bridges, as is the case with Telegraph Road Bridge. So we, at the outset of this particular opportunity to perform monitoring for the Michigan DOT, the first thing was to actually design a monitoring system, not in a generic way, but to go into consultation with the owner and say, what are you worried about? What are the things that you would like to see from data that would answer questions that you may have with respect to the performance of your structure? And they identified four primary objectives to the monitoring system. The first was to obviously track the pin and hanger performance and the health, looking at things like fatigue, locking that may be occurring from corrosion. They also have a concern about deck cracking. This consumes a significant amount of their annual budget is maintaining bridge decks in traditional steel girder concrete deck bridges. Also loss of composite action that may be due to severe deck cracking is also of primary concern to them with respect to the performance and the safety of the bridge. And then the fourth objective is that they would like assistance in using this data towards load rating of that particular system, which for them is essentially a means of capacity assessment of that particular structure. So we looked at the things we could measure, and we've developed interrogation uh, algorithms that can be automated that will take these measures, such as acceleration, strains, environmental parameters, such as temperature, and to look at the analysis of the health and the performance of the structure, such as fatigue, locking, deck expansion, what have you. So in order to essentially get the data that's required to start to build those automation tools, we deployed a dense monitoring system on this particular structure, consisting of 70 sensing channels that were deployed uh, about four years ago, um, consist of both accelerometers, uh, but largely mostly relying on strain gauges, looking at local measures, looking at these very specific modalities of deterioration that the owner had interest in. So we deployed a network of accelerometers on the outer girders of this particular bridge, giving us a means of doing modal analysis for model updating. 
We also deploy dense arrays of strain gauges looking at things as low distribution factors across the girder lines. That's something the owner had interest in. Also looking at essentially moment profile at six locations in the bridge. The center span is fully composite, so we have two on girder line two and six in the center span. And the wing spans that sit on both sides of those expansion joints are not composite action. And we're also interested over the bearing where we would see tensile action in the deck, what the performance of the bridge was at that location. In addition to that, we have a number of environmental sensors looking at the thermal measurements of the structure itself, in addition to ambient measurements of temperature at the bridge site. We'll do routine monitoring on this bridge, so we collect four minutes of data at 200 hertz every four hours, and we've done so uh, for the past four years. The building block of the monitoring system is a wireless sensor that we developed at the University of Michigan, known as the Narada Wireless Sensor. Um, this is a relatively old platform now. It's about 10 years, a little bit over 10 years old. Um, but it's still a workhorse that we've built a lot of reliability and robustness into. So it's still a preferred platform for a lot of our field deployments. Um, it has 16-bit data acquisition resolution. We can collect data on four sensing channels. We'll often do that in these applications. It uses ZigBee telemetry to move data essentially from the sensor to a base station that then has cellular access to the internet where we'll move the data into our SenseStore data server. And it also has the ability due to its onboard 8-bit microprocessor to embed algorithms, although in this particular presentation we will not highlight any of those attributes uh, with respect to embedded computing. Before we can take it to the field though, that sensor has to be coupled with a few other hardware components as well as uh, put into watertight enclosures to protect it from the elements. And you can see our typical deployment scheme shown here. These are accelerometer nodes. These are our strain gauge nodes. One of the unique things about our strain gauge nodes is that we do have uh, switching on the sensing interface. Strain gauges will draw a significant amount of energy when they're not in use, when you're not taking measurements. So we have a MOSFET switch interface as well as a Wheatstone bridge circuit. Uh, to modulate essentially how much energy those strain gauges are consuming. These sensors are powered using solar cells that then recharge lead acid batteries. The lead acid batteries are a necessity in very cold climates such as Michigan, uh, Minnesota. On other bridges we would use a rechargeable lithium chemistry uh, for our battery. And you can see some of the components here. The first place where we deployed our sensors was on the hangar plates themselves. Again, the owner is quite interested in terms of the performance of the hangar plates. Are they truly acting in a tensile fashion? What are the levels of strain? Are there fatigue concerns on these particular hangar plates? So on and so forth. In order to make that analysis, we've deployed eight strain gauges on four hangar plates in the bridge. So there's a total of 28 hangar plates, but we selected four based on a finite element analysis, the ones that we felt would see maximum uh, stress. And we have a traditional rosette in the center to give us our tensile action. Uh, we have a number of strain gauges down at the, at the hole to essentially look at stress concentrations. But the strain gauges of primary interest in this particular presentation will be the ones that are installed on the side of the hanger plate looking at essentially bending action that may develop in those hanger plates. Those hanger plates are intended to be in pure tensile action with perfect uh, mobility between the pin and the plate. But if you get locking, you'll introduce moments. And we're looking for those moments, both in plane as well as out of plane mending moments, suggesting potential wear down of that particular plate uh, pin interface. In addition, we're installing sensors to get moment profiles through the section at key locations. So there's six locations where we install metal foil gauges, as well as uh, what's called a bridge diagnostic intelliducer, which is a half bridge uh, strain sensor. Uh, that's well suited with long gauge lengths to be used for monitoring strain in concrete decks, both static as well as dynamic strain. So we'll put that in profile to essentially give us the strain profile through the cross section at six locations in that particular bridge. And you can see a picture of that, the metal foil gauge on the girders, and those essentially uh, put onto the surface of the slab on the lower surface. Our base station is a key part of our system. Um, it's used essentially to communicate data from these individual sensor nodes. You can see the solar panels here. It communicates data to our base station, which then communicates data through the internet to the University of Michigan, where we'll store it inside our database system. Shown here is the long-term sensor performance. So when you have the ability to put sensors, such as wireless sensors, in this case, it's an academic prototype, it's interesting to sort of see what is the robustness of this technology. And one of the things you trade off when you do go wireless is, is that you're trading off the dedicated communication channel you have with a wire between the sensor and your data acquisition system. So shown here is just uh, the performance from uh, early 2012 into last, uh, <clears throat> last winter. 
and you can actually see the performance. So the blue dots is every time a node logged in and sent data uh, to the database server. So you can see that early in our deployment, we had to learn how to enhance the robustness of the system through the winter months, which really challenges the hardware. So the first winter that we were out, February 2013, we had a failure of the base station. Uh, so we were blind to what was going on in the sensor nodes. We fixed that, and in the next winter, what you'll see is a number of dots through the winter, winter 14, uh, both 13 and 14 with the polar vortex winters in Michigan, so relatively cold, little sun, um, much better performance, but not what was desired. Uh, so we changed the design of the charge controller that was using the solar panel to recharge our batteries, and then optimizing the configuration of the software, the sensor node, to essentially optimally use the scarce energy we would have in the winter months. And in the next winter, uh, much better performance. So not 100%, but relatively speaking, above 80% in performance reliability of that sensor network. Shown here is the acquisition of data as a function of time that's being warehoused inside our SenseStor server. And today we're even above uh, this 26 gigabyte mark. We're upwards of the low 30s uh, as of uh, last month. Okay, one other thing that is of interest is the induced behavior on the structure. So what we want to capture with our monitoring system isn't the behavior of the structure 24-7. A lot of times that structure is not really being excited with high levels of response. And we already have an issue where we have limited bandwidth and limited energy to collect data with. So we have to be very clever in how we operate this monitoring system. So what we do is we're essentially looking to just acquire the response of the bridge under truck loading, which is one of the largest loadings the bridge will see that's dynamic in base. Obviously, thermal loads are probably larger in terms of induced stress, but here we're looking at the dynamic behavior of the bridge. So there we use the strain gauge array that's on the lower flange of all seven girder lines to essentially estimate when trucks are or are not on the bridge. We want to know when do heavy trucks come over that bridge. So shown here, for example, are three different trucks that we may see in the state of Michigan. Uh, the Telegraph Road Bridge is on the I-275 corridor out of Toledo, Ohio, up into Detroit. So you do see heavy truck use there, a traditional 18-wheeler, five-axle trucks, and then you see multiple axles for heavier loaded uh, trucks. And you can see the corresponding strain gauge response on those lower flange surfaces of that particular bridge under these different truck loads. What we do is we use a support vector machine to automate the processing of extracting response measures of the bridge that directly correspond to truck events. Because a lot of the data we collect do not actually correspond to truck events. They may correspond to small cars that we're not as interested in, or periods when the structure is not loaded in those four minutes. So sometimes at late at night, for example, that bridge may not see a vehicle for a minute or two. And we want to parse out when do we have load events and when do we not. So we train a support vector machine. We take some sample data that we know has trucks in it based on video recordings of traffic on that bridge. And we essentially train uh, this support vector machine to essentially go through our strain time history data and to determine times when we have truckload events. And that's what's being shown here is these are the seven girder lines. You can see tr two truck events here. This, for example, is a subset of our training set that we use to train the support vector machine. These are actual time history measures of strain that correspond to known truck events. And then we use that to essentially to automate the processing of extracting truckload events within our time history data. Once we have essentially responses that correspond specifically to known load events, namely truck events, we begin looking at a damage detection strategy. And there's many strategies that one can adopt. And there's no one right way. Uh, so at the outset, I'm going to present, I'm going to say that I'm only presenting one methodology, but there's many others that could be used. So I'm not advocating this is the best or the only, uh, quite the opposite. But in order to show you sort of a complete picture of this, of this area, there's really two ways of doing damage detection to date. One is based on models, model-based damage detection. So we're going to interpret our measurements through the lens of physics. Model updating would be a classical strategy within that family. But the challenges with these methods is that they do require some assumptions at the outset, and they're also quite difficult to account for environmental and operational variability that we may see in the system. There's an assumption on the static aspect of the performance or the properties of that structure that are somewhat invariant to these EOCs, but we know that not to be the case. The alternative family of damage detection strategy are largely based on data, data-driven methods. Um, this is essentially looking for anomalous behavior as a statistics problem looking at anomalies based on data and the features, statistical features of that data. 
Pattern recognition and classification method methodologies are sort of the core family of methods that are used there. Uh, more recently, uh, often referred to as machine learning methods, but they're more or less uh, quite similar. The challenges here is that while there are fewer assumptions, they are, does require extensive amount of data that sees the uh, profile of that structure in a complete way. And the other challenge is that it's hard to interpret some of the meanings from a structure's perspective on anomalous behavior. And that may represent challenges in terms of adoption by the broader owner community. We've adopted just one method, uh, statistical process control, which is one of the oldest uh, statistical based methods of anomaly detection. It's widely used in chemical processing um, applications. Um, and it essentially uh, provides us with a way to look at the data in a fully autonomous way with a statistical basis. We're encoding some view of the physics of the problem just in terms of the configuration of the sensors themselves. So it's not to say it's blind to the physics. Uh, that would not be true. The physics come through the instrumentation and how we process or pre-process that data. But once we have that pre-processed data, then we bring it into an SPC realm where it is mostly based on statistics. We want to explicitly account for environmental and operational variability, the EOCs, and we want to essentially expand the method to have a reliability basis to it. So the proposed strategy is as such. We extract our load events that gives us pertinent responses of the structure that we have primary interest in. Okay, these are the responses that are going to see the higher levels of strain response in our strain measurements. But we have to account for the EOCs. And the way we're going to do is through regression methodology using nonlinear regressors. Uh, there's many that are available, including support vector regression, among others. We'll be using a Gaussian process regression process model to essentially model the nonlinearity between the response and parameters of response with the EOC profile that that structure actually sees. Once we see that, we'll then classically apply statistical process control, which in many respects to our application is relatively black box. We're essentially charting the behavior under periods of normal expected behavior and then looking for transgressions of anomalous behavior against that using statistical XMR charting. The first step is to use Gaussian process regression, which is a common nonlinear regressor that's widely used for its scalability as well as fidelity modeling nonlinearly the behavior of data against EOC parameters in the structural health monitoring realm. Here we're treating essentially our observed time history data, in this case the extracted load event, as one instance of a Gaussian process around which we can essentially model that Gaussian process to serve as a predictor of future behavior. So if I have a vector of EOC, once I have my trained uh, regression model based on Gaussian process regression, I can predict what that response or metrics of that response should be based on this Gaussian uh, basis. Statistical process control uh, then would take those nonlinear regressions to essentially remove the EOC variability we would see in that time history data so that we essentially have data normalized sets that then we can apply SPC uh, to. And SPC essentially is looking at determining a model that provides a statistical basis of what's defined as normal behavior, setting thresholds on that through an XMR chart method to determine essentially when we have transgression on those thresholds, essentially alerting us to anomalous behavior. And that would be what they would call an out of control process associated with our system. So our four stage process is first is to extract our, our truck events. So that's the support vector training to get our truck events. Once we have that, we look at metrics off of those truck events, such as peak strains, uh, moments, uh, what have you. And we will train the nonlinear regressor to that. So that's still a training stage. Once we have that, over defined periods of normal behavior, we'll set our control limits, essentially our uh, three sigma, what have you, one sigma uh, limits on normal behavior. And then we'll essentially do process monitoring where we can continuously extract these parameters and apply them to this SPC model to alert the owner of anomalous behavior. So let's look at it on a few different applications. The first is looking at the link plate behavior. Again, our primary concern is in-plane and out-of-plane uh, bending. Shown here is just some of the bending parameters. So statistical process regression model. We're using the peak acceleration at the center of the bridge to essentially give us some measure of how large the load is, implying that larger trucks will induce higher peak accelerations, vertical accelerations at the center of gravity of the main span. And you can see essentially our in-plane bending from our strain gauges and our out-of-plane bending. Uh, in theory, these should be zero, but they're not, largely because it's a skewed bridge. Also, it's not a perfect interface with friction 
between the pin and the hanger plate. And we'll apply our MR control charts uh, to that. Uh, you can see some outliers here. That's not to suggest that that's anomalous behavior. But if you see that transgressing in a more consistent way outside those control limits, that would be the alert that the owner would then be aware to. Shown here is the analysis associated with composite action. Uh, you can see here the in-profile strain. Uh, we have composite action in the center, as indicated here in the tensile res or compressive response in the deck in the top area of the steel girder. We use that to extract the neutral axis. So we're using neutral axis as a means of looking at the degree of health in that composite interface between the girder and the concrete deck. And where we know we have composite action based on steel uh, uh, studs up on the top surface of the girder, we do have uh, good composite action. Where we don't, uh, we are below the theoretical uh, neutral axis as if we did have uh, composite action on one of the spans. And the other span just falls a tad bit below that, but with high variability there due to the frictional interface that exists between that deck and those steel girders. We then apply our statistical process control to that to provide, again, this real-time model of anomaly detection uh, for the owner. The owner is also interested in the thermal expansion of that particular bridge, so we've also looked at that using the strain gauges that sit in the actual deck themselves. If you had thermal contraction, you should see that essentially plateauing off at high temperatures where you would essentially have end-to-end -end, uh, abutment in your pin hangers. This isn't the telegraph or a bridge, but that is one of the things that's of concern in these pin hanger designs. So shown here is the relatively nonlinear uh, behavior between essentially thermal expansion and the temperature that's measured on the deck itself. Um, one of the sensors was bad, uh, so we don't count that, but we still have five good measures of deck strain as a function of temperature, as well as the Gaussian process regression model on top of that. And again, we'll apply our statistical process control methodology to that data. All right, in the few minutes that are remaining, I'm going to go through this relatively quick because uh, of the time. Uh, but one of the things we're doing is we're expanding the cyber physical system to also control the loads that are imposed on the bridge themselves. So we now have a framework at which we can extract the load events. And we're interested in if we had sensing technology in the vehicles themselves, namely in heavy trucks, could we control the dynamics of the truck to minimize its detrimental impacts from a vehicle bridge interaction uh, basis. So we're looking at that, but we're also at the same time trying to unravel high uncertainty that's often associated with our understanding of what truck loads are. So the ASTO code basis has high uncertainty associated with that, largely because most of our understanding are based on analytical models, not empirical evidence of vehicle bridge interaction. So what we're doing is we're instrumenting trucks with sensors, namely accelerometers throughout the truck, that can measure essentially the dynamics of the truck as the truck is transversing in our road network. When that truck is close to our bridge that has a wireless monitoring system, the truck self-registers itself into the network of the monitoring system. And they time synchronize their wireless sensors to essentially share a common time basis for their measurements. And as the truck is driving over the bridge, it's communicating its measures to the bridge that's then doing analytics on that particular data set. So what we have is time synchronized, not only bridge response, but also the dynamics of the truck around which we can perform modeling of the vehicle bridge interaction that may be occurring. So we're conjoining for the first time, essentially, the vehicles that have dynamic measures and the dynamics of our stationary infrastructure system to better understand the inherent couplings that exist between these two critical components of bridge behavior. We do that with a cyber physical system architecture that then, once we have the ability to model that particular interaction, we can use essentially a control theoretic framework to start to explore how could one control the dynamics of the truck to minimize the impact factor that's associated with the truck dynamics on a particular bridge. And we're doing that within our cyber physical system architecture. So we've done some preliminary tests where we've instrumented a truck. This is one of the trucks we have at the University of Michigan. It's a typical 18-wheeler type truck that essentially has a defined payload on it. We instrument that with our wireless sensor networks, the same wireless sensors that sit on our bridge, and we'll drive that over, the, over our telegraph road bridge. And we'll use the data that we have to look at vehicle bridge interactions. So let me just cut to the chase. We can uh, position that truck on that bridge at all times using both GPS measures as well as some laser measures that we take at the, at the bridge. Shown here is the acceleration at just six of those accelerometers that are on the outer girders of the bridge. We also have some measures of the strain. This is the strain through the height on the three metal foil gauges on the girder shown here. 
This is the same time history record, time synchronized, but now from the truck. So we have accelerometers on the axle and we have them on the body. So we treat these as quarter car planar models uh, to simplify the analysis of the data that we have and the use of that data. So you can see here uh, the time history data corresponding to the same time history I showed you on the previous slides. And we're modeling that based on a state space formulation. So we want a state space model that provides the basis for a control solution that can be used to control the dynamics of that truck. So shown here is our quarter car model with lump uh, discrete parameters to its stiffness and its damping. And we're essentially formulating a state space model based on subspace identification, which is a time domain based uh, curve fitter, if you will. Uh, based on subspace projections of our response data Y. So we do that in two stages. We use one stage in the free vibration response to get us our system matrix A and C. And then we use the part where we know we have the truck on the bridge to actually just to determine the time variant B matrix. So this is not a time invariant system as you would typically see in controls, but it's a time variant system for which the B matrix has time dependency. So it's indexed by time step K. So we can actually, after we have through subspace ID our A and C matrix, we can perform a constrained optimization problem to extract out the time variant B matrix through the use of load kernels that are projecting based on position of the truck, essentially their imposed load on the structure. Okay, and that's just showing here is the formulation of the constrained optimization problem in this construct of a state space framework. Shown here is the results from that state space model that we developed, the time variant uh, state space model. The blue is the measured response, in this case accelerations, and the red corresponds to the predicted response, attesting to the accuracy of that time history uh, record and the model. Same thing for the strain uh, shown here. The next step is now to use these models for control, which is some of our ongoing work in this season's uh, measurement campaigns this summer out on that bridge. So just a few words of conclusion. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities in the space, cyber physical systems, and it's not just in the health management area. One of the other areas where we're seeing is intelligent transportation systems. And in Ann Arbor, we have a large testbed system that has uh, infrastructure, roadside infrastructure for V to I and V to V transportation applications. And we have over 3,000 vehicles in the Ann Arbor area that essentially have dedicated short range communication or DSRC transponders they're essentially sending out beacons to these roadside units that are logging the location and some of the parameters of these vehicles in the network, okay, such as their speed, the type of vehicle they are, what have you. We've been working with that team looking at things uh, such as providing early warning systems to vehicles that may be associated with safety applications, such as ICE warning systems. So we've been developing an ICE warning system uh, for that network uh, in Ann Arbor where we have roadside sensors that wirelessly communicate that information to vehicles that have this dedicated short range telemetry to essentially warn them of black ice conditions both on pavement surfaces as well as on the top deck of our bridges which often have black ice uh, conditions that are of serious concern to motorists and shown here some of our deployment. The other unique thing about sensors and one of the things that's coming up that's relevant to cyber physical system is sensor mobility. Once you're wireless, you've freed yourself from wires, you can mobilize that sensor into a lot of different applications. So I've been working with a collaborator in the geotechnical group at the University of Michigan, Demetrius Zekos, looking at applications of UAV for post-earthquake reconnaissance to acquire perishable data, both through cameras, but as well through geophone applications using shear wave analysis uh, to characterize essentially the, the behavior or the properties of subsurface conditions of a, of a soil system, for example, for liquefaction assessment after an earthquake. And we can do that by using the UIV to deploy our sensors, in this case shear wave uh, geophones, and then uh, essentially use the UAV to drop a weight. So we have a robotic arm that can take that up to controlled heights, drop it, we can measure where that weight fell to geolocate it relative to our sensor array. And that's one of the things we're doing with our UAVs. So I think the future is very exciting for cyber physical system and analytics in general. Uh, I know at Michigan there's a lot of students that have a strong interest in this particular area. Um, I think it really does address some of the grand challenges that have been identified by the National Academy, improve our urban infrastructure. They're very relevant to energy security as well, thinking about sustainability of our systems and how we can approach that from a CPS framework. Um, it is a new paradigm, so it does require a bit of expertise in a variety of areas, not just in the civil and environmental domain, but also in others such as big data, um, sensors, what have you. 
And I think there's a lot of opportunity for the technology, particularly in the ITS space, mobile sensing op, uh, areas. And we're also more recently looking at hybrid system frameworks to optimize power management across a sensor uh, network. So with that, I again want to thank uh, to the faculty for the invitation to provide this morning's Warren Lecture. Um, I do want to credit my group. Uh, all the work I present is my students' work, not mine. Uh, so that is a picture of my group, and I'd like to acknowledge the funding agency that supported this work over the past few years. Thank you. If you could just wait for the mic since it is recorded. Uh, when you were talking about the support vector machine, um, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the metrics of performance that you use for classification? You mentioned it was some measure of strain, yep. but was it like just at one location or many? Was it at like low dimensional or high dimensional feature space? Right, so the, the primary feature before we elevate it up uh, through sort of like a, a use of basis functions is essentially looking at the strain time history record. So that becomes the, uh, the metric. So we'll actually have a trigger on the amplitude and then based on that we'll assemble essentially our feature vector over a finite dimension and then train the SVM around that particular. So the feature vector was the time history strain measure. It wasn't necessarily a parameter like a peak strain or energy under curve over time. It was just the actual vector which performs well. Uh, a metric of evaluation, we've done a study looking at how to support vector machine perform relative, for example, just um, I could have, the way I pre-pruned that data by thresholding, you could actually use that to try to extract the truck. Uh, relatively comparable performance, but slightly better with support vector machine. But one of the challenges of support vector machine is they're only as good as your ability to train them. And that is uh, something that does require quite a bit of training data to give you those levels of performance. So there we trained over thousands of uh, samples that we have that essentially were hand tagged uh, by some undergraduate students going through the data that we had. So. Thanks, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, one question I have is the challenges with um, monitoring deteriorated infrastructure because you could have an existing state of damage that when you put on the sensors, right. The right. changes that you're seeing, you know, right. the right. failure could be very local and it might be difficult to capture what's existing. So That's yeah. absolutely correct. I mean, it's, you know, again, this isn't a silver bullet solution. Uh, this is just one attempt at that. But I think you're 100% right that there can be pre-existing condition that the question is how do you baseline for that? Like mm -hmm. if you go, like for example, Telegraph Rail Bridge, we installed this system when the bridge was about 38, 39 years old. We already knew of a lot of deterioration there, but there was a lot of deterioration that maybe is not detectable based on the visual inspection reports, things like that. How do you baseline for that? Uh, I don't have a very complete answer uh, for you, but that is a challenge. Um, I think the community is aware of that challenge. How to go forward with that challenge, I think, does take a lot of that a priori knowledge that comes from the inspection. Um, you know, certainly, I'm, you know, there's two camps, I think, in the SHM community. There's one camp that kind of envisions a future where there's no visual inspections. There's just sensors automating everything, and that's all you would need to do this optimal management. There's another camp, and I fall in this camp, that still sees tremendous value in the visual inspection. That qualitative data is actually still very, very valuable. I think it's actually that data that starts to help you unravel some of those questions about baseline performance, even before you've got a sensor on that particular structure. Those inspectors and the engineers that supervise those inspectors have a very good intuitive feel for the structure uh, in a pretty impressive way. So you do, wouldn't want to discard that. And I think that value comes when you have those kind of conversations. What's baseline behavior, what, what not? So I see SHM and these sensing technologies as adding to the, to the arsenal that we have, not as a replacement technology to visual inspections. So. I have a question concerning scalability. Um, obviously, if you want to do some local computations, there could be limitations due to microcontroller, microprocessors, and things yep. that are close. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're having a lot of a lot of sensors, they're recording a lot of data. Yep. It can get very, very big, very quick. Have you looked at any uh, methods of dimensionality reduction, such as independent or component independent component analysis? To we've done that on other work. You know, a lot of pre-processing to a lot of the algorithms that would be used in the SHM community do rely on things like principal component analysis and things like that. 
to essentially pre-process your data before you're going into a classification stage. So we would, here we did not. Uh, in terms of data dimensionality, I mean, that's a very serious issue. Um, and scalability then becomes sort of a forefront question associated with any solution you bring forth. And I think what we showed here is mostly on the back end. It's sitting in the cloud and it's doing analysis on these large servers. What I didn't show here was a lot of work that we've done in the past where we've actually front loaded a lot of that computation into the sensor node. Like for example, the strain gauges that were on the hanger plate here, uh, one of the things that are of interest is the fatigue. Uh, what is consumed fatigue life on the hanger plate? There we would actually embed a fatigue algorithm directly into the sensor node as opposed to sending all the strain time history data. And that's just recognizing a practical reality of the technology that I have limited energy and I have limited bandwidth. And these are scarce system resources I have to optimize their use. So it's proven to be, depending on the algorithm, more optimal to do your processing at the front and then send less data than to keep sending the raw data. So that would be another facet of, of this type of work, but I didn't show it here. But I think it's a very, very good point that the scalability is going to have to rely, I think, on both facets. is intelligence at the point of data collection and then on the back end. Um, and the question is, is what are you trying to do with that data? Can you leave raw data at the sensor node? Can you actually not record the raw data? Is that okay for the application? I think that's very application dependent. I don't know if that addresses your question, yeah, but yeah, sure. okay. Well, I had a question about your control um, application. So when you're talking about control of these trucks, would it be like you would address the speed or? Okay, so there's two strategies that we're playing with now. Uh, one is actually controlling the parameters of, of the driving condition of the truck. So that would actually be the speed as well as the lane that they're in. Most trucks go over the slow lane. Um, but there may be instances where you want to sort of distribute that load and that wear and tear that comes with that load across your bridge. You do have a load distribution on your girder lines, for example. You see max load when the truck is over your girder line, a lot less away from it. Um, one girder sees roughly about 30 to 35% of the total truck load on one girder line in this particular bridge. Uh, so you could control to start looking at how do you maximize your life expectancy of your structure based on load distribution. That could be where the truck is or how fast it's going based on certain properties of the truck, suspension system, and the bridge. The other area where we're playing right now is actually putting a reactive mass damper on the back end of a truck. And is actually looking at the dynamics in the suspension system to try to minimize essentially the impact factor. You can't take off the static weight. The static weight is what it is. Gravity holds it to the bridge. You can't pull that off the bridge. But you can minimize your dynamic load factor that's on the bridge. And in this case, this bridge sees for most trucks on the order of about 10% dynamic load factor. So could you trim that off a little bit? I'm not certain really how much impact that has on total life, but it will have some. And that's one of the more theoretical things we have a curiosity about. Practical application, I'm not certain how widely accepted this could be. But one thing that is promising, though, is, is that trucks in the United States already have dense instrumentation on them. They all have GPS trackers. The trucking companies want to know. They want to sort of manage their, their time frames. They have sensors already. There's models in Europe where European uh, road agencies are essentially giving trucks permission to go over, over their limits, their weight limits, if they adopt some of these technologies. So we're seeing that at play already in the European market. It's possible it could come to play in the US market where you have trucks already have sensors. You just have to build that link from the sensor to your bridge. What could you do with it? It opens up a lot of interesting things. It could even be a way we better finance our infrastructure costs. Instead of gassing taxes, you toll how much life you're consuming on a truck, like a truck consumer. Because it's the trucks you worry about. It's not the cars. Cars you know, ride for free, if you will, on bridges. Um, it's the heavy trucks that consume their life. Okay. Um, well, our speaker will be around today, and he'll be at the wine and cheese. Um, so let's thank him uh, for wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.